tomorrow we have um, uh, three guest musicians who uh, will either play on their own or play with you. Um, uh, one of them is Benoit Felton, who's a pretty darn good harmonica player from France. Um, Benoit, are you here? There he is, Benoit. Um, and, um, uh, <laughs> and then we have... Um, uh, uh, Andy Revkin, who's a New York Times reporter who covers global warming, and he plays guitar upside down, and he's asked to borrow one of your guitars. You didn't know about it until, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, he can rent a guitar from somebody else. <laughs> um, well, he can use my guitar, really. Yeah, well, that's how you do it. That's how he would do it. Anyway, he, he has a song that he wants to do called The Mighty Fine Line, and then we have um, uh, Terry Huval. Terry, are you here? Ter Terry Huval. Oh, way back there. Oh, you moved. Um, Terry uh, spoke Cajun French before he spoke English, grew up in Louisiana, and is the genuine article Cajun fiddler. So, um, and he's actually played on stage here at Freedom to Connect before, so um, we will welcome all those three. Uh, they're, they're techno musicians but so now without any more diddling thank you guys see you in about uh, two close to two hours um yes so now we have um three sort of politico regulatory type talks um and um, I'm going to treat them as three individual talks, except that when they're done, we will save the questions until they're done, and then you can address the questions, and I'm sure there uh, will be some interesting interplay. But the first talk is by Chris Savage, who is an attorney with Davis Wright Tremaine. Uh, he's a law par a partner in the firm of Davis Wright Tremaine. He represents Wired and Wireless Celex on regulatory matters such as interconnection, universal service, pricing, and tariffing. And his practice also covers internet matters like web hosting, IP addressing, and domain names. Bruce Kushnick introduced me to Chris in 2001, and uh, we've been friends ever since. Chris will speak on the rebirth of intelligent regulation. And the death of the um, old stupid regulation. <laughs> yeah, about three in the afternoon, whenever the coffee's wearing off, it's a great time to be talking about you know policy and abstract stuff. But I'll, I'll do my best. I have to give the obligatory disclaimer, which is to say, since I'm in private practice, if there was any doubt, none of this reflects the views of any of my clients who don't know what I'm about to say, probably would disagree with it. Uh, but in any event, uh, it's mine and not theirs. Uh, is it on? I have to be very yeah, and Mike, whatever. Yeah. There you go. Test. Does this work? Yes. Good. Okay. Anyway, um, why do I call it intelligent regulation of the death of Chicago School? The Chicago School, as you all know, who knows what the Chicago School is? Anybody? Cool. Okay. Great. Then I'll move on. All right. Because uh, I only have ten minutes. Let us think, since we have some engineering types here, about gravity. You cannot ignore gravity, right? If you ignore gravity, you die. Uh, but in our business world, sometimes you let it work, right? If you're on a roller coaster, you like gravity. Sometimes you hate it and fight it, like in airplanes. But one way or another, it's there. And we never think about it, uh, most of the time, as good or bad. It's just there. Why do we think about market forces differently than we think about gravity. No one will deny, no one who has a clue will deny that market forces exist, but there's more to it than that because economics claims to be more than saying this is what will happen. Although they deny it, most economic policymakers are telling you what you should do. Do this if you want to be richer, if you want to be better off, if you care about efficiency, then you have to do this. It's prescriptive, it's not merely descriptive. Eliding an awful lot of economic theory, where that little is to ought move takes place is in what economists say and believe and think about consumer choice. You hear it in arguments all the time. 
Let people make their own decisions. Who am I to tell somebody what they want? Who is the government to think that they know more about blah, blah, blah? All of that comes out of this, this movement of the Chicago School, which makes individual human decisions sort of the, 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 the apotheosis, they, they, whatever. They turn them into gods, right? They, your decision making is the sole best way to know what you want. Um, in technical terms, this is called, a, called revealed preference theory. You look at what people do, and you assume that what they do reflects what they want, and you assume that their choices on what they want are based on a complete rational understanding of themselves and the world and prices. <laughs> I'm not making this up, okay? Uh, it is, but but th this is true, okay? It, it, it is actually an empirical assertion, though they hide it as, as an axiom, the general axiom revealed preferences. But what they say is when people make choices, that's the best way to know what they want and the best way to know what's good for them, okay? Now, in our own private lives, we all know that's bunk, right? I can't decide what breakfast cereal to have in the morning. <laughs> you know, how am I supposed to decide what wireless plan I want? Uh, the problem with real pressure theory is it's actually wrong. Now, back in fairness, in fairness to the, the economists of the world and the Chicago School economists of late 50s and early 60s, they did lots of incredibly good, incredibly intelligent work. A bunch of them earned Nobel Prizes, and they deserved them. Okay, Figuring out the implications of revealed preference theory, all these cool things that go into making economics work, was a lot of hard work, and it was in reaction to over-regulation and very unintelligent regulation, sort of in the tail end post-war New Deal stuff. But starting in the 70s and going beyond, uh, what we've learned is that uh, when you do empirical studies of how people actually make decisions, what you discover is they don't act rationally. Okay, People don't know what they want. Their choices are not consistent, or in the mathematical sense, you get intransitivity of choices where you can prefer A to B and prefer B to C and then prefer C to A. Think that the system kind of breaks when you do that and try to make it mathematically work. Plus. Our ability to choose things is as a result of, you know, basically our evolution as hunter-gatherers on the savannas, right? Our ability to make decisions is really, really, really good for that. Okay, that's why there are six billion of us. It's not really, really, really good for the kinds of choices that we're called on to make in the marketplace in the 21st century. And what that means is we just make mistakes. No problem, right? I mean, everybody makes mistakes. The problem is this has some serious implications. For at least the last 30 years, my job as an advocate has been very easy in this space, right? Because what's the purpose of regulation? Well, if you can create competition, your job is to create competition, and that will produce the best result for everybody. And if you can't create competition for some reason, then your job is to mimic the results of competition as closely as you can, because that will produce the best results for everybody. We've all heard that, right? And, and that can go either way. We, the, big guys, little guys, you, which arguments you make depends on who you represent in the, in the, the, you know, the particular space. I'm serious, I'm aware, you know. But, 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 but the fact of the matter is those arguments depend on this revealed preference theory thing that I was talking about, right? Because if you can't assume that what it is that people say they want is what they really want, or you can't assume that the choices that they will make in the marketplace are accurate choices in terms of producing their own happiness, then although the market will produce a result, just like gravity will produce a result if you throw a rock off a cliff, there's no reason to think that result is a good result. It is what will happen, but it's not necessarily what ought to happen. Okay? So, I just covered that, so I got ahead of myself. The arguments were easy. Let's assume for the moment that we actually pay attention to the facts. <laughs> I, I guess I'm watching lawyer, but still. Uh, pay attention to the facts, which is that people, when they make decisions, make mistakes, make predictable kinds of mistakes, can't handle certain kinds of decisions, and so on. What that does is it changes the entire focus of regulation. I mean, first of all, in terms of the politics of the situation, it allows you to make a case that regulation might make sense in some area, even if there's no particular obvious market failure. But number two, if you're going to regulate, you don't necessarily believe, as the Chicago schoolies do, that everything can be reduced to a price. And if you just get the price of whatever it is you're selling right, the market will do its magic and work everything else out. You end up having to be a little more focused 
and say, well, if people can't make decisions rationally as we'd like them to, maybe you need to take a few steps to regulate the decision architecture so that people are more able to make decisions that actually are in their interest. Second, and this is a bigger deal, if you can't assume that when you add up all the results of the marketplace choices, that's the best for society, you know, sort of the, 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 everything's for the best and the best of all possible worlds, that creates a policy space within which you can legitimately argue that the government, society acting through regulation, ought to set objectives for a particular sector or for a particular industry and to say, well, the market will work it out. Well, why do you say that? You can answer that, ask that question in a way you couldn't a few years ago. And then finally, the nirvana that says, well, we can solve all our problems if we just have competition. You know, broadband, fine. Let's have the cable company, the phone company, clear wire, you know, municipal networks, you know, intergalactic, you know, teleportation, whatever. you got five competitors. Therefore, you have competition. Therefore, it's all okay. Not necessarily so. Maybe, maybe not. But you've got to ask the question, which is not something we've been accustomed to doing. Now, in some ways, this is good because if what you are trying to do is, you know, oppose the efforts of some traditional incumbent to do something and the incumbent says, oh, well, you know, it's all with, let the market work. You can say, ha-ha, don't let the market work because the market doesn't work. Fair enough. But that isn't enough for the good guys, however you define them, to win. First, the fact that we know that the market will not necessarily lead to maximizing welfare is a very different statement than saying that we know what will. <laughs> I don't know what will. You don't know what will. What I'm suggesting is we all need to start thinking about that in a way that doesn't depend on, that, that doesn't have the easy out of, well, the market will solve it. It won't. Second, it's great to get all excited about the little guys and the municipals and this and that because the big guys are now going to, to have a disadvantage in the, uh, in the regulatory policy space because their traditional market-oriented arguments aren't going to work. Uh, yeah, that's going to be true for somewhere between six months and a year. The, the, these people are slow but not stupid. Number three, uh, getting to this, timing is everything. If and to the extent that there is an opportunity to transform the regulatory system a little bit, to be a little bit more citizen friendly, person friendly as compared to economic interest friendly, we don't have like 10 years to figure this out, okay? We have, I would suspect, on the order of 6 to 18 months to figure this out. So if there were a time for political interest in action on this space, now would be it. Uh, and then finally, the reason timing matters is there's a great thing that, that the Chicago School has pointed out called regulatory capture, which is over time, any regulatory agency implementing any regulatory system will come to be highly adapted to the needs and interests of the large, rich entities that it regulates. And if they weren't large and rich, you wouldn't need to regulate them. Mm -hmm. So there's a limited time frame here within which action can be taken to change the, the, the frame of the debate. So that's it. Trying to be quick and simple. Here is a summary of what the Chicago School says, right? People know what they want. They'll make rational decisions. they much better than the government, blah, blah, blah. Here's the alternative of what actually happens based on what we know, uh, again, from the, the thinking about uh, uh, the research into human decision making. And if you're into references, here are some things you ought to read that will tell you a little bit about these things. Great. Do you think? Do you think? I'll just get set up. You want to hold, hold this or use it? No, no, whichever way. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Slater from Google. I first met Derek when he was an undergraduate fellow at Bertman. I thought that undergraduate fellow was like military intelligence, kind of an oxymoron. But that was before I got to know Derek. Um, Derek went on to join the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, where he served as activism coordinator, outreach coordinator, um, and then uh, he uh, joined Google's public policy team here in Washington, D.C., where he currently works um, with Rick Wood and Alan Davidson and a bunch of other 
fr good friends and really good people. And Derek is going to speak primarily about NLAB, but I think he'll tell you more accurately than I will. Thanks, David. Um, Let's see if I can. Either have to, yeah. I'll do the mic. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My, uh, as David said, my name is Derek Slater. I'm a policy analyst at Google. I actually... Um, I work out in Mountain View, not here in uh, D.C., no, no worries, um, but I work on broadband policy uh, both here in the States, also uh, around the world, and I really have the pleasure of getting to work in Mountain View with our engineers uh, and talking with them about how we can, one, think about the technical issues at the heart of bigger broadband policy issues, but also thinking about technical solutions to help address policy issues and fundamentally how do we help sustain uh, an open, healthy, innovative internet. And the project I'm going to talk to you about today is not a Google project, but rather a collaborative effort uh, that we've been involved in and, and helped start called Measurement Lab, uh, which is an open platform for network researchers to deploy new internet measurement tools and for end users to test their broadband connections and learn a little bit about how their broadband connection is actually uh, functioning. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, uh, really, what MLAB is, and then I want to set it in sort of a, a broader context. I think today, we've all had the experience uh, of using our internet c connection and asking uh, a really deep-rooted question that, that really is part of our shared internet experience, and that is WTF. We have, always, we have all asked that question at one time or another when running an application that yesterday worked fine, but today is chugging along slowly. And we don't know if it's our PC, if it's the application, if it's the connection, if it's our broadband connection, if it's congestion, if a cable's been cut, if it's the person we're talking with, WTF, or more delicately, what's going on. <laughs> um, you know, we don't know. And, and this... Um, I think is really, uh, there's, there's a more complex issue here, which is that end users, uh, it's hard for them to analyze, understand, characterize the performance of their connection. So it's somewhat easier to understand what's going on in your own PC, what's taking up the most RAM, and so on. But to understand what's going on in the network is a much more complex task. It's complex for users. It's also hard for researchers to understand. Uh, this project started with uh, Vince Surf and myself having a conversation about this problem of end users being uh, unable to really understand what they're getting from their broadband internet service provider. And I actually called up Sasha Monrath and Casey Claffey. I think many of you know Casey. She's, she's an incredible researcher at CADA. Uh, and I, I uh, ended that conversation with, with a lot more knowledge and very, very terrified. Uh, terrified because there is so much about that we don't know about how the internet is actually performing. There is lots of data that is simply uh, out of our reach at present because we have not yet built the tools uh, to get them or implemented or deployed the tools to get that data. Uh, that's a big question that I think broadband policy needs to reckon with so that we can make good policy based on real, actual, empirical data. Measurement Lab breaks off a tiny slice of this issue, which is, again, giving end users, giving the public more insight into what they're getting when they sign up for broadband, which is, of course, not only important to end users, but important to application developers who want to tune their applications to make sure they're working okay, make sure they're not getting wrongly blamed for problems that aren't their own. It's important for ISPs on the same level who sometimes need to detect problems that are going on in the network, don't want to be wrongly blamed. And again, it's important for policymakers. Uh, so we started with this question, uh, Vince Surf, myself, and a couple others at Google. What we did was invite a group of researchers to our campus and basically say, how can we help? What are you trying to do? What are the challenges you're facing? How can we help? And uh, a few of these researchers will have already been long working on uh, broadband or internet testing tools of various sorts. Um, similar to the speed test you've all seen across the internet, hit a button, it runs for a couple seconds, tells you the speed of your connection. But these tools can be uh, quite a bit more sophisticated. Now, I'll just run this in the background while we're, while we're here. Uh, not only looking at what your speed is, uh, but uh, why you're getting that speed, or why you're not getting the speed you're expecting. Uh, and running more advanced diagnostics along the way. At present, these tools are relatively geeky. 
Um, but they are trying to get at some of that more interesting data that could tell us a lot more about how the internet works. Uh, some of these, again, are speed diagnostic tests, uh, bandwidth estimation tools. Others deal with application performance and more specifically whether certain applications are being blocked or throttled by an ISP, uh, which of course from a policy perspective is quite, quite important. So getting this sort of transparency uh, is really essential. So we talked to these researchers who are building these tools and one of the challenges that they face is they do, do not have widely distributed servers all around the world with really great connectivity uh, to deploy them, which means that when they get slash dotted, they can't, uh, all, the users can't easily run them all uh, at the same time. They don't have enough connectivity. Uh, they can't deal with a variety of confounding variables when you're trying to measure across a long distance rather than to a server that's nearby. So we said, uh, Google was, well, let's try and help, and we worked uh, with the researchers to build Measurement Lab, which fundamentally is simply uh, a distributed set of servers for researchers to deploy these client-server testing tools. It helps individual users learn a little bit more about how their connection's working, and helps researchers learn a lot more, in aggregate, about how the network's performing. Now, this is, again, not just a Google project. Uh, it's something where we're providing the servers, but it's driven by researchers uh, who we invited to this, re to this workshop and who are building these tools, along with uh, Sasha's, uh, Sasha Meinrath's Open Technology Initiative, uh, the Planet Lab, and the Planet Lab Consortium, which is a, a research group based out of uh, Princeton. Uh, all of these folks have uh, you know, played critical roles in uh, building this this platform. Uh, and again, it's researchers who are building the tools, not, not Google. We're simply providing the servers for them to make use of. Now, right now, this uh, project is very much a proof of concept. We say beta, but that's only because people don't know what alpha means out there in the rest of the world. Um, we launched this about two months ago with three servers, uh, which were quickly hammered by the slash dotters and the boring boomers and so on. We now have about 12, we'll have 36 by the end of April. Uh, and we're hoping to get more partners to provide more servers. Uh, we really have one partner who's providing some hosting. But I know that many of you may work at companies or institutions that might have connectivity going around, might be able to fund some servers. Uh, we would be interested in talking with you to help build out this platform. If you know researchers who are interested in piling in, that would be great. We really want this to be an open, collaborative endeavor uh, where eventually not only will there be these servers and these great tools, but great UIs so that users really get a lot of value out of them, and also open data. Uh, public do all the data will go in the public domain, and everyone will be able to access it through some sort of repository. We're not there yet. We don't have the resources for that yet, but we're interested in working with others to help build out that platform and hopefully solve uh, some of the thorny technical problems, uh, data acquisition problems that can in turn help us really get a better internet experience and in turn uh, solve some of the thorny policy problems that we face. Thanks. And check it out. Now all at once. <laughs> Okay, well, while you're getting set up, let me introduce John Peha, who is the chief technologist of the FCC. He's also a full professor at Carnegie Mellon, and it's, he's not only a full professor at Carnegie Mellon, but he's a full professor in the same department as David Farber, Marvin Sirbu, Laurie Faith Craner, Rahul Tangia, and our own Alicia McDonald. And um, John will speak on, good timing, John will speak on the mythology of rural broadband. John, thank you for coming. Take it away. So, uh, use the hand mic. Okay. I'm John Piha. I'm, the, as you heard, the chief technologist of the Federal Communications Commission and a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, because of the former, I first say that any opinions expressed today are my own and do not represent uh, the chairman of the commission. Uh, also, I hope you'll forgive me if I make uh, limited comments on things that are before the FCC at the moment. Um, there have been a lot of discussion about rural broadband of late, uh, which is good. It's an important topic. But some of the arguments I, I've been hearing, I thought, were based 
sort of on myths and fallacies that, that bothered me and there's nothing I could do about it until someone made the enormous mistake of giving me a captive audience. Uh, so it is, it is your sad fate to have to listen to me respond to some of these comments. Um, the first myth uh, here is that there's, there's just less interest in broadband in rural areas. Uh, and if there's less interest in it, it's perfectly reasonable, of course, that there's less of it in rural areas, so, so the market must be working just fine. Uh, to support this statement, uh, all you got to do is look at the, uh, at the penetration numbers. This, this graph shows the, the y-axis is the percentage of households that subscribe to broadband and the x-axis is year. And you can see these top two curves are urban and suburban and penetration is going up and up. Uh, and, the, the and, and about the same. And the bottom curve is rural, which is also going up, but, but lagging way behind broadband, or behind urban and suburban. So there's fascinating speculation about why a third fewer households in rural areas would want broadband. Right? Is it differences in income or education or profession or even culture? It's really interesting stuff. I recommend it. The, the only problem is it's wrong. Um, and the first hint that it's wrong is if you look at the percentage of households with internet of any flavor, which is what this is, and on the left you see the U.S. as a whole, and on the right you see rural areas, and in fact, U.S. is a little bit ahead of rural, but not very far ahead in terms of uh, penetration. Uh, and if you look at the right blue, that's just broadband, and there there's a big difference. But in fact, uh, if you add in dial-up, it gets pretty close. So perhaps this means that, that rural areas like to subscribe to internet, but they like their internet slow. <laughs> and perhaps it has something to do with the fact that not everybody has broadband. Now actually, we don't really know who has access to broadband in this country. Uh, the, the data is a little spotty, which is uh, a challenge. But I tried to add this up last summer, and as best I can tell, roughly one in three rural households do not have access to at least terrestrial broadband services at any price. So maybe it's not a shock that one third fewer of them subscribe. All right, so this too. Sorry, maybe they are interested in broadband, but you know, broadband is more costly for the most part in rural areas. And if customers are unwilling to pay that, that larger cost of build out, then the costs exceed the benefits. Uh, this is version two. If the costs exceed the benefits, then the market must be doing what markets are supposed to do. There are other arguments that Chris has made why that, but I'll, I'll put his aside, make a different argument. Um, this is a much stronger argument than the first one, admittedly, uh, but there are problems here too. Um, one of them is that the benefits of broadband do not go only to those who subscribe to the service and therefore pay for the infrastructure. Um, there are spillover benefits to other groups, and people to, to decide to pay for something based on the benefits to themselves, not the benefits to everybody, and any product or service that has these kind of spillover benefits, a free market tends to underinvest in, or in the language of economics, positive externalities lead to market failure. So why do I think there are spillover benefits? Two reasons. One is that broadband has an impact on the community it serves, not just those who subscribe. Um, there have been some, some interesting studies of late showing broadband deployment is followed by an increase in small business creation, job creation, property values, more so than comparable communities that didn't get broadband deployment. And those things all benefit people who never go near the internet. So there's one spillover benefit. Um, I should also caution that these studies are great, but we really need a lot more work here to understand just how much this is, you know, how big effect this is. Is it all communities? Is it mostly some kinds of communities and not others? I hope there'll be more work there. Uh, a second kind of spillover benefit is on internet users outside the community. Um, you know, once, when a rural community gets access to broadband, users in other communities gain the ability to, to, to communicate with those people uh, at a higher rate, at least. Uh, social networks gain their members, e-commerce merchants gain customers. These are uh, network effects, that is, increasing the size of the network benefits for those who are already part of it. So there are spillover benefits. Myth three. Okay, so, so rural communities are interested in broadband, and maybe they're not quite getting quite as much of it as we might like. But you know, they may not be getting the advantage, the benefit of this, this new thing, this new, this new f luxury, but at least they're not being harmed by, by, by the lack of it, right? Well, unfortunately, that's not quite true either. I mean, maybe it used to be true. 
when, when most people have dial-up, and the first few start to get broadband, those who get broadband get, get a benefit. But those who, who, who stick with dial-up probably aren't harmed at all. But when broadband becomes the norm, it's a whole different game. Um, this is the other side of network effects, the side that gets a lot less exposure than the, the, the version that I just presented to you, which is that the reducing the size of a network harms those who remain in it. And you can think of, of dial-up internet as a different kind of network. As people you know, defect, they leave dial-up, they move to broadband, there's less and less dial-up left. The people who are left have a problem. For example, applications that were, and content that were once optimized for dial-up users aren't anymore. Right? It's not just that I can't use that great new telehealth application that needs broadband. I used to be able to go to these websites and use them easily because they had mostly text and they were really fast. And now they're filled with images and they take forever. You know, my, my so-called friends are sending me email with five megabyte attachments that take an hour for me to download. It takes, it is, it is, it is, the internet is less and less useful to me because I'm being left behind. And it's not just internet users who are being left behind in some sense. Actually, non-internet services are also degraded as broadband replacements become popular. Newspapers being the, in, an obvious example. I grew up reading the Seattle Post Intelligence Survey at Rest in Peace. Uh, you know, try and make airline reservations if you don't have broadband or at least dial-up, but broadband makes, makes a big difference. Try getting, I discovered lately, uh, tax forms from the IRS, health information. All of these things, if your entire community has no access, you are actually worse off every year because broadband is becoming so common. Myth number four. Government involvement in infrastructure always helps solve all of these problems. Um, especially if they have that one-size-fits-all, cookie-cutter kind of solution. Uh, to pick a non-telecom example first, uh, if you've ever worked in developing countries, it is very important for a developing country to have a good source of energy. Right? And uh, so hydroelectric dams should be built out. Hydroelectric dams are wonderful things. This happens to be a picture of uh, one that Kenya built a couple of years ago. Um, but do the benefits exceed the cost of this particular project? And is it a fit for a community? This particular dam that I'm showing, for example, required a big piece of debt from Kenya. Uh, happens to have you know, well, well, brought energy to a region, but 7,000 residents of that region lost their homes, and many of them ended up in the slums of Nairobi. And this, this and now energy-rich region lost so much farmland that 82% of its income was lost. So, you know, is, was this a good fit? I'll, I'll leave it to the people of, of Kenya to decide whether this was a good fit. I'm going to return that to broadband, where it's less dramatic and I don't get as nice a picture, but it's still important. Um, lots of communities have created wireless broadband networks in recent years. Sometimes public phones, sometimes private phones, sometimes a mix. Um, and some of these have, have boasted great successes. Sometimes government has been such a, a user of the technology, in fact, that the cost savings has exceeded what it's spent. Sometimes they've advanced other kinds of community goals, but some of them, as we've heard in other talks, have not been so successful. Um, I would argue it's this one-size-fits-all thing. Uh, I've had the, the, the privilege of working with the Pittsburgh City Council to come up with a solution for Pittsburgh, where community leaders initially hoped for a citywide Wi-Fi-based network. Um, and then we got in and we looked around and, and we found at least for in that place at that time, if you look at all the benefits you could hope to get, they didn't seem to measure up to the costs, which were not small. Um, maybe it's relevant that Pittsburgh had DSL and cable at the time and 3G wireless was coming soon. So Pittsburgh came up with a uniquely Pittsburgh solution. Right? Wi-Fi downtown, not citywide. Free services up to a limited point. They have a financially sustainable system. They built on local institutions. In particular, they, they addressed a broad community need that was much larger than just providing broadband. It was revitalizing downtown that everyone already agreed to. So for Pittsburgh, this, I would argue, was a very successful solution. Taking it to any other city on the planet may not make any sense. So some lessons. Uh, broadband matters. I probably don't have to convince people here of that. Um, we should not assume that the market solves all, so all problems perfectly. Chris might argue that. Uh, we should not devise local or federal initiatives that simply replicate what the market is already doing well. We should not assume that an effective strategy in one community can be exactly replicated in another. We should try to seek innovative technology, business, and policy approaches. And we should particularly study our past experiences and learn from them. I don't think we do enough of that. 
and government can create the right environment. So my last slide very quickly, the gov I would point out the government has done a lot or is doing a lot in 2009 on that score. In 2009, we are seeing a whole lot of spectrum become available as part of the digital television transition, both, both for licensed use and for unlicensed use in the, in, uh, in the TV bands or what has formerly been the TV bands. In 2009, we're seeing $7.2 billion in grants and loans coming out as a part of the, the Recovery Act. Uh, we're seeing new information gathering, a broadband inventory is beginning this year. And uh, we're seeing the beginnings of the development of the first, uh, at least official written, U.S. national broadband plan, which is under development. And uh, I think there might be a pe few people in this audience who have, have some opinions on that topic. So uh, I hope you will all uh, participate and, uh, and uh, contribute your ideas to the process. Thank you. So um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, uh, if people would like to come up to the microphones, or maybe there's, maybe it's completely non-controversial and nobody has any questions, beefs, etc. Um, I invite anyone out in internet land who isn't in the room to um, ask a question on the chat. Um, uh, okay, we have uh, Tim Denton of the um, uh, Canadian FCC. Thought Control Commission. Yes, they spell it CRTC up there. Tim. Chris, you made a, a very valid observation, which gave away the whole show in a sense, because you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, you've seen both sides of this issue upside and down. And there was one point in your point where you said, but we know when the conditions are that the market's won't work, I believe, but we have no idea what the conditions are where regulation will work, or something to that effect. Could you expand on that just briefly? Well, it, there's a comedian named, I think, uh, Fry, who did imitations in the of, of famous people, and he once did a, uh, a fake interview between Lyndon Johnson and Jerry Rubin. And Johnson asked him, well, why? Why do you want to do all this? What are you going to do when you tear down society? And Rubin said, we're just going to sit around and groove on the rubble. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot more fun and a lot more interesting to explain why things don't work than to figure out what will make them work. And, you know, what my, my precise point was that I think we can be pretty confident based on the sort of behavioral economics research and all your props to uh, Sarah W. on the, 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 the chat, uh, who actually knows this stuff, that we have good reasons to believe that markets aren't going to work exactly right and may go way off if our objective is maximizing people's welfare and utility. What will work? I don't know. I don't think any of us knows. And I think one of the problems of having been sort of in the Chicago School of Ideology for the last 30 years or so is most of us aren't really very well trained about how to think about that in any systematic way. Uh, but I think if, if regulators are not going to take the easy way out and say, market, 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 that's the job. Uh, and I'm glad it's you and not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have one question from this mic. Hi. Um, this goes to uh, Andrew. Uh, Andrew Feinberg with uh, Broadband Census News. Uh, this goes to John. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk some of these studies that talk about job creation and benefits to local economies from broadband. Were you referring to the Connected Nation studies, or were you referring to, uh, to other, other independent ones that weren't funded by NCTA and CTIA and all the others that are on Connected Nations board? Uh, no, I was not referring to Connected Nations. Uh, for example, there's a very nice set of papers by, uh, in different permutations, Sharon Gillette, uh, Bill Lair, Marvin Serbu, um, there's some, some nice work out of University of Texas, Sharon Strover, there's, uh, there are no, I'm, I'm thinking of, of academic papers that have... Rahul Tongia. Rahul Tongia. Thank you, he's my colleague, I could have gotten in trouble. Oh, 
Uh, actually, I'm, for, I'm forgetting something. I, I'm, I'm sorry. The, 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 this, this sounds odd, but there are, you've all heard about transparency in the new administration. There are new rules. In fact, I got briefed on them this morning. Uh, if anyone asks me a question who happens to be a registered lobbyist, will you please talk to me afterwards? I need your name, rank, and serial number so I can file the appropriate paperwork. Um, no, really, this is serious. Are there any registered lobbyists in the room? If in the interests of there's one, okay. Um, uh, anybody else? <laughs> anybody else? Um, you don't, but we. I will be filing this online. It will. Yeah. Um, could we could we make sure we get your name because the we do really have a some you haven't, but it would be. I, I, I don't actually. I, I don't okay. know if enough. Anyone, if anyone asks me a question, as I understand, I need okay. to get them. I think. My bank All right. That I'm not, but thank you, John. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, this actually is directed to John Shockey yeah. of the newly telecom unemployed. The um, <laughs> um, the actually the question I have has to do with the larger issue of both. Uh, uh, mobile broadband as well as rural broadband, which I don't hear a lot of discussion about the problem in the middle of the network, which is backhaul, which is if you're trying to do anything with rural broadband or mobile networks, there is a vast gaping hole in the middle of the network. And, you know, Verizon and AT&T, you know, even as commercial carriers are struggling mightily with this. And I'm just wondering how the administration at this particular point is looking at that particular piece of the puzzle. Um, I don't know if I can answer how, how the administration is looking at this. It is, if you look at the the uh, Recovery Act, I mean, it, it is, and, and the discussion that went behind the Recovery Act in Congress, it's clear that they were talking about backhaul as well as lots of other things, so it figures in there. Um, you know, uh, Uh, <laughs> there are lots of, actually, <laughs> there are lots of problems. But yeah, th those three are among the three. Um, I guess I don't know what to, what, I mean, that is among the mission that is in, in part of NTI, in front of NTIA, although saw a host of other things, including reaching disadvantaged groups, co you know, public computing, they have a, a big plate, and I don't know what they're going to focus on, and that's, that's their call. But, you know, it, I certainly agree with you, it's an issue. Um, Jay Hellman. Uh, my name is Jay Hellman. I uh, often refer to myself as an overeducated real estate developer. The overeducated is in the technology side of the house. And in 1980, when I was building downtown office buildings in D.C., I said I could foresee the development of computer and communication technology. And I said this is as big as inventing a tractor. And before we invent the tractors, everybody was a farmer. And so here I am building downtown office buildings which were based on the paper-based manual labor paradigm for processing and communicating information where transportation was actually a communications activity. You were moving people to information or information to people. So uh, I ended up out of years of research and then frustration starting a telecommunications company which I didn't have time enough to make real called CTN, Completing the Network, and it was based on putting the last mile as fiber rather than copper. So I really appreciated this morning's panel, but I particularly appreciated, Chris, some of the comments you made about regulation versus the market, because in the real estate world, we are a highly regulated world. You can't do anything without getting permits and everything reviewed 14 different ways. And what I've realized is, is that government rarely understands what the heck it's regulating. So although there were defects in the market, there were also defects in the regulation side, but that doesn't mean we don't need regulation, but we sure need a lot more intelligence and thinking. So I want to encourage people to make a real stab at trying to ask the right questions, but I'd like to leave with one comment about my philosophy of government, and that is its job is to write the rules so that people find it easier to make money doing the right thing than the wrong thing. But they should always start with, it's important for the private sector to be making money, now let's try and understand the darn thing. So thank you. Uh, response? 
Another question, Jeff Daly. Hi, Jeff Daly, AppRisen.com. Actually, uh, building off of that, in writing the rules, how is it that our policymakers, our legislators, our regulators, how can they make informed policy and, and maintain this idea of technological neutrality? Um, it seems like the two are potentially at odds with each other because different technologies have different pros and cons, and shouldn't we be adjusting policy based on the pros and cons of those technologies? You're the chief technologist. Yeah. <laughs> Just precisely why it's a hard question. Um, technology neutrality is, is, is clearly something to aim at. Um, the fact that technology, I mean, we, we want to create an environment where other people, you're right, they, they have different pros and cons, and where different people can try different things and figure out which one works, and, and, and we don't de facto decide. Now, that's actually much harder to do than it sounds. I mean, the people who are most comfortable with technology neutrality are the non-engineers, uh, because when you actually write a definition, it is very hard to do so in a way that doesn't favor one technology or another. But that is, I mean, all I can say is that's what we strive to do, and uh, and that's right now there are people working on that very problem, actually. I'd want to challenge that. I mean, we are not technology neutral as a society between houses that have electricity and houses that don't. And we're not technology neutral society between cars that have airbags and cars that don't. I, I, I think the technological neutrality is has buried in it the kind of thing I was talking about, which is an assumption that if you government just stays out of the way, the market will figure it all out. Uh, and it, the market will figure something out. Uh, but, but whether what it figures out is actually what ought to happen by some objective standard is a totally different question. So, uh, again, it's easier to tear things down than build things up. It's easy to say technology neutrality doesn't actually get you anywhere, but the next question is what, what does. But I, I think technology neutrality is, is sort of a false mantra these days. Hmm. Derek, did you know? Hey, uh, uh, to sort of echo what, what Chris was saying, technology neutrality doesn't mean that we simply, you know, pick anything uh, whatsoever based on based on the data. We need to set the goals, what, define what our goals are, and look at the data on what different technologies actually do and bring to the table in given contexts. And that may vary, as John said, from uh, context to context, but it's not neutral in the sense that we don't, we stop looking at the data and just bury our heads in the sand. Um, just just to echo the, the, the sets the goals is the key part of that, that you can set the goals without saying specifically how they'll met they'll be met and giving some flexibility to people to figure out how to do it well but again that's a it's easier said than done but it's a um, I'm going to violate moderator neutrality and say yeah sometimes some technologies are just better than others and we ought to use them um, like if I had to choose between broadband over power line and fiber it would be a no-brainer right um, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I'm Amy Wohl. Oh, Amy, I'm, yes, of course. Hi, hi, Amy. I'm a recovering School of Chicago economist and an information industry analyst. <laughs> um, hi, and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so are we all. <laughs> so, Chris, you can have the you can have the mic. It is for you. Um, I, I guess what I want to say is that um, as an economist, I know that um, although the market won't necessarily fix everything, um, that unfortunately when government tries to fix market mistakes, it often inserts a lag into the market cycle so that the policy which is intended to be the correction often comes at such a lag interval that it, it creates a new mistake so that we're not fixing anything, we're just making things worse. And uh, I sit here during what's going on in Washington, tearing my hair out and thinking, oh my God, are we making you know, a worse mess of everything? Well, on the other hand, you can't just sit there and do nothing. Um, so I, I guess what I'm hoping to, to, for and what I want to ask you about is, what can we do to try to get the technology things that we're knowledgeable about, because I can't make recommendations about finance, that's not my field of expertise, to try to get people to make these considerations that have to be made in in, in addition to the market, because there's some things where we need the market's help to, to help us decide things. We don't know whether people would rather use netbooks than PCs. That's a market decision. But we do know that we sometimes have to help when 
we're making infrastructure decisions because infrastructure decisions take so long to play out that if we let five different companies spend resources building five sets of the same technology, that what we're doing is wasting endless amounts of time and money. And what I want to know is what kinds of things can we do to help the government make good decisions? And that's the thing that I find really worrisome because every time I go down to Washington to stand in front of some group of government people to make a recommendation, I have the feeling that my words are falling on very deaf ears. Okay. Um, once you step back from the mantra of the market, what you recognize is that the, the fact that, that, that the market doesn't necessarily work doesn't mean that there are not conflicting interests. And the, sort of the meta thing to the market for resolving conflicting interests is politics. So Indeed. the first answer to how can you help government deal with these things is elect the right people. Uh, and, and there's really no substitute for that. Uh, who the right people, I mean, we, I don't want to get off on our political process, you know, elect the best person of the choices available. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, you're hosed for the duration of, of that period of time. Uh, that said, I, you know, cha it, it is going to take a certain amount of time of challenging the orthodoxy of the market works, the market works, the market works, to get people to understand this. So I would encourage people who actually know this stuff, like, like again, Sarah and others, to make a point of putting this stuff in the public record. Wait a minute, you can't just rely on the market. Wait a minute, you have to do this. Wait a minute, here's this study, here's this analysis. Because although the process is slow, agencies like the FCC are legally required to respond to the stuff that's in the record in front of them. In that sense, they're much better than courts. Uh, I, I think the antitrust world is, is sort of ruined for the next 20 years because it takes that long to cycle through the new learning from the economists. Uh, the regulators are actually faster than the courts in that. It says flood, flood the public record with these kind of considerations, and they'll have to be dealt with. I just one, one uh, thing to add. Infrastructure is special. That is a message that carries a lot of weight right now. We're in a special moment where people are reawakening to that notion. That infrastructure is special, and that's the message that we really need to be building on. And I think it's you know, wrong to look back and say, well, regulation is, gets in the way, and so on and so forth. We have first principles that say, look, this is essential infrastructure, and it doesn't mean we robotically apply the telephone network or regulation or broadband world. That'd be silly. It does mean that we should consider how important this infrastructure is to our economy, to our society. We now have more of a language about spillovers uh, to, play, to, to sort of uh, spell out why infrastructure matters. We have more of a language economically than we've ever had before. And now I think we're at a time where people intuitively get that infrastructure is a critical part to economic recovery and economic growth. So that's the message of the moment. And um, th could you say one or two words about why infrastructure is special or how infrastructure is special. Um, what Harold, part of the problem, oh, oh, we, well, jumping, we care too much about broadband infrastructure than we care about whether fruit, whether I get Fruit Loops. Yeah, we do. We care. Well, that's that's it. Yes, but why do we care about broadband infrastructure? It's not being designed now. It's just happening. It's, it's happening. happening. It's yes. The marketplace without any intentionality, without any policy, it's just being foisted on us, and then we'll get to deal with what we got. Um. Well, I think the time has come to thank the panel for a very good and provocative discussion. Um, and um, welcome to Freedom to Connect. I hope you guys come back. Now, um, Tom, do you have your... Uh,